For 125 years, the American Academy has brought together leading artists and scholars here in Rome to learn from Italy and especially to learn from each other. So throughout this year, we're celebrating our anniversary with a series of events around the theme of encounters or incontri. And by exploring encounters across time, space, and modes of inquiry, we are approaching the essence of this academy, which is creative people learning from each other. So tonight's event brings together three very special residents of the American Academy in Rome this year. Uh, well known to many of you, all three are international leaders in art, design, and culture. And we're so pleased to be able to bring their voices together here for the first time. One of the three has uh, generously agreed to moderate the conversation, allowing the director to sit back and enjoy the evening. Uh, and he will introduce the other two participants. So I now have the privilege of introducing him. Adam D. Weinberg is the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney Museum of American Art since 2003. In his 16-year tenure as director, he has transformed the Whitney, making it ever more critical, more contemporary, and more inclusive, and of course, making the bold move from its nearly 50-year home on the Upper East Side to its current location in Lower Manhattan in the stunning design by the Renzo Piano Building Workshop. It's difficult for us today to comprehend how radical this proposal was when contemplated even a mere 10 years ago. And it's a testament to Adam's leadership and the goodwill that he was able to marshal the resources and the momentum for this absolutely visionary move. He's known internationally as a brilliant curator and as a cultural leader. And this year he's serving as the Marion and Andrew High School critic in residence here at the American Academy in Rome where he also serves on the Board of Trustees. During his residency, he's working on a number of scholarly and curatorial projects, including uh, David Hammond's Day's End, his only public sculpture, which will be built in the Hudson River adjacent to the Whitney. And of course, David Hammond's was a fellow in sculpture here at the Academy, and Day's End is a memorial of sorts as an homage to Gordon Mata Clark. Um, a Cornell-trained architect, so there are many intersections here. Welcome here to the American Academy. It's really my great honor tonight to facilitate this discussion. My job is to kind of do the part up front, clear the decks, and let the um, artists speak. My um, introduction is a little bit on the longer side so that we can get to the heart of the matter, I hope, in the conversations today. So. Um, as you know, this conversation foreshadows the second exhibition in the Academy's Encounter series that opens in May 2020, which will juxtapose the works of Meritu and Yoon. At first, this may seem like an unlikely pairing of individuals, but hopefully after this evening's conversation, the combination will be much more clear. It's a pleasure to welcome Julie to the Academy, who has recently arrived as a resident, and I'm especially delighted to participate in this event as the Whitney Museum and the Los Angeles County Museum have just co-organized a major survey exhibition of 25 years of her art, which is currently on view at LA. And for those of you who are back in New York in May, please come and see it in New York in May. Um, but by way of introduction, I thought I'd just quote a little excerpt from uh, the catalog for first about Julie. That gives you a little bit of a snapshot of her background because I think um, you'll see a lot of images up there today and maybe um, some of this will resonate with that. Julie Maratu was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in 1970 on the tail end of dramatic liberation movements on the African continent, student uprisings across the globe and civil rights and anti-war struggles throughout the US. Although Italy had occupied Ethiopia from 1935 to 1941 in the fascist bid to expand possessions in Africa, the country was never colonized like many of its neighbors. Under Haile Selassie, who ruled until 1974, Ethiopia adopted the Charter of the Organization of African Unity in 1963 to promote solidarity among African countries in the face of East Cold War, East-West Cold War to defend sovereignty, and to eradicate colonialism on the continent. Mayor Ratu vaguely remembers the political instability and violence under the military dictator Mengistu Haile Mariam. 
As Americans fled during his deadly Red Terror purges, Meritu's mother, Dory, an American educator and former Peace Corps volunteer working for the U.S. Air Force in Addis at the time, organized the family's airlift out of the country and sudden move to the U.S. in 1977, while Julie's father, Asefa, a professor of economic geography at Addis Ababa University, was offered a position at Michigan State University and followed later. Now, this bio of Meritu's beginnings, I think, set up a number of interests that have preoccupied her work for the last two decades. Her concern with and her attention to social and political content, the critical role that memory plays, the effect of dislocation and migration, the notion of transnational and transcultural identity, and I would say, because she's an extraordinary human being, a profound sense of compassion for others, and, of course, a total fascination with mapping and systems. What this bio doesn't address is her desire to become an artist and her passion for making as a form of knowledge unto itself. And I hope this evening that's one of the things that we get to. Julie studied art and art history at Kalamazoo College in Michigan. Um, one important influence she cited was that of seeing Caravaggio's work here in Rome in the summer program that her father led here in Rome. Julie attended the MFA program in printmaking at RISD. She practiced both printmaking and drawing um, when she was at RISD, as the idea was not so much as a means to an end, but printmaking and drawing as something unto itself, an end unto itself. And Julie has said, which um, she has identified the act of drawing as an activist gesture, which I find totally fascinating. And I want, hopefully, Julie to talk a little bit what that means. What is drawing as activist gesture? In 1998, Julie studied in the core program at the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, where she began working on monumental scale, aided by airbrushing films of paint. Julie also participated in a number of resident, residency programs that have truly been critical to her development. They're not just simply things that she passed through, just as I imagine her residency here at the American Academy. They will have an effect and they will be a give and take. In 2001, she did her residency at Studio Museum in Harlem, which had a major effect, where she did one of her first site-specific works directly on the wall. In Walker Art Center in Minneapolis in 2003, she worked with 30 high school students from East Africa. At the American Academy in Berlin in 2007, she produced her extraordinary gray series in which she grappled with destruction and memory in post-World War II Berlin. Julie has received many, many honors, notably the MacArthur Fellowship in 2005, the Barnett and Anna Lee Newman Award, the U.S. Department of State um, Medal in the Arts, and I would add, under President Obama. Her work has been included in exhibitions worldwide, including the Carnegie International in Pittsburgh, Documenta in Kassel, the Busan Biennial in Korea, and her art is in the major collection of museums worldwide, SF MoMA, MoMA, the Guggenheim, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Whitney, to mention a few. And this year, Julie Meritu is the Roy Lichtenstein Artist in Residence at the American Academy in Rome. I'm also thrilled tonight to meet, um, actually for the first time this week, and delighted to introduce architect Mi Jin Yoon. In 2018, Mi Jin was appointed Dean of the School College of Architecture, Art, and Planning at Cornell University. This appointment is particularly noteworthy in that she oversees not only the disciplines of history, theory, and practice of architecture, as well as planning, historic preservation, and urban and regional studies, it's hard to believe she actually has a practice on top of all this, and I'm not even done. It's also the umbrella for the MFA and BFA programs, including Cornell and Rome, and we have a number of students here tonight from the Cornell program, welcome, as well as interdisciplinary programs in computer graphics, matter design computation, which I'm not even sure quite what that is, and, it all, and she also interfaces and works very closely with Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island, the new, newly developed campus. Um, Cornell College of Art um, and Architecture not only graduated such notable architects as Peter Eisenman and Enrique Norton, it also trained such, photographer, such artists as photographer conceptual artist Louise Lawler, painter Susan Rothenberg, and I think maybe particularly relevant, the hybrid architect artist Gordon Mata Clark. It takes a very special in, um, individual with a unique philosophy of learning and teaching to have such a purview. 
and not treat any of these disciplines as autonomous. And I keep looking to the left because she's watching me over there. So for those of you on the camera, you'll forgive me. I always have to see what the, how they're reacting when I'm doing the introduction, for God's sake. Uh, so she does not treat these disciplines as autonomous, inviolable, disconnected, but, um, or as orphans, but as understanding that all of them may be thought of as an integrated and speculative whole. It's also noteworthy that Cornell is the only Ivy League school that offers a Bachelor of Art degree, which is where May Jean received, May Jean received her undergraduate degree in architecture, which is proof that it often matters to begin when you're young. Following a Fulbright year in South Korea, Mijin received her master's degree in architecture from the Graduate School of Design in Harvard in 97. Beginning in 2001, she began as professor at MIT and served as head of the department from 2014 to 2018 before assuming the deanship at Cornell. And while at MIT, she created a minor in design that has attracted literally hundreds of undergraduate students, which John has attested to the fact that that's the case. He counted them all this morning. She also co-founded a transformative course titled Design Across Scales with Neri Oxman. In 2004, May Jean, along with Eric Howler, established architectural practice Howler & Yoon, which is known for, as they describe it, working across the domains of architecture, urban design, public space, immersive experience, and design strategy. The evocative titles and far-flung locations of her projects offer an impressionistic sense of the scope of her work. One of her very first and notorious projects was Defensible Dress, which is one of my favorite pieces. It was first exhibited at LA MOCA, and it was inspired by porcupines and, blow and blowfish. She told me the image is not in the slides tonight, which I'm very disappointed about, and it was something that actually was wearable architecture, and it activated the space around the viewers. She's also designed exhibitions like Three Degrees of Felt from Aztec Empire Exhibition at the Guggenheim in 2004, White Noise, White Light in Athens, Greece in 2004, a temporary installation for Athens Olympics, the Chengdu Sky Courts, a reinterpretation of the Chinese courtyard, the aviary, um, a project called Aviary in the United Arab Emirates, um, and something that is in process, I believe, is a piece called Float Lab, which you'll see some images of, which is a kind of floating lab in the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. In 2015, Yoon won the New Generation Leader Award from Architectural Record. She was the recipient of the Audi Urban Future Award in 2012 and received a United States Artist Award in Architecture and Design in 2008. And the, the grand one of all, the Rome Prize in Design in 2005. Her work has been exhibited at numerous museums, LA MOCA, Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt, MoMA, Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, EVOM in Valencia, National Museum of Art in Tokyo, and in 2003, I'm very pleased to say, the Whitney Museum printed and produced one of her great artist books called Absence, which was a tribute to the World Trade Center. This year, Mijin is the Colin Rowe Designer in Residence at the American Academy in Rome. And I'm going to end by just quoting myself in my intro to Julie's catalog, because I think, actually, this quote, if you replace the idea of artist with architect, it applies to them equally. It's just two sentences, so I'll spare you. Painting is many things to this artist. So it could be architecture is many things to these artists. It is conceptual, technical, synthetic, ideational, aesthetic, political, and memorializing. It is also profoundly existential, questioning what it means to be alive on Earth, or, as her art posits, to be floating above and beyond this locus in order to further grasp or alleviate our terrestrial existences. So if you substitute those words, I think you have a statement that probably could apply to both. And it is my great honor and privilege to introduce Julie Meritu and Mi Jin Yu. A myth-making around the architect as this archetypical hero. And I think, uh, for me, it was more through the avenues of the artist that I think um, I learned the qualities that were silent mentors, maybe, to me. So, like Agnes Martin's like mm. super rigorous drawings or Solowitz, like wall-based drawings or rule-based drawings. I love the idea that mm. by just setting rules, you are actually creating a work 
and if you set the rules in the right way, they could be generative and take into account context and chance at the same time. Um, and I think those kind of have lasted with me for a long, long time, maybe more than my favorite architect at any moment. So, um, you know, you and your works, and we can see a lot of them behind us here, um, you grapple a lot with notions of architecture and architectural space and architectural systems. And in your work, Eugene, you've done art exhibitions, you've made art works. Um, you know, this is a moment where the relation, the boundaries are very much blurred. And I'm just curious, what for you are the linkages for both of you between these two? Are there really separations, and 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 how do you see those um, uh, those separations, if any? Um, I mean, I would say that there there are. Um, Okay, I'm going to use someone else's words because I'm not good with words. And um, <laughs> when Charles Eames was asked, you know, what are the boundaries of design, he responded, what are the boundaries of problems? And I think that, uh, for me, um, suggests that all our disciplines are grappling with questions and issues, and they are a kind of inquiry-based um, activity and so the boundaries are where the inquiry leads you and the medium can withstand let's say at some point maybe the medium is eroded so much that it asks questions of is this this or is this that um, but the, there's always clarity that it is a work of art or a work of building art or yeah, I agree completely. And for me, I came into like the language of architecture again, really intuitively, in, in, in that I was trying to sort out and understand my intention of making and intention, mm -hmm. like, and, and in that, and in that was a, a way to sort out who I was in the world and where I was, and trying to figure out the world around me. And um, and I knew that abstraction was the language that I was wanted to uh, made a commitment to work in and that it was the language that I found the most freedom in and in that afforded an, an amazing amount of capability to investigate and, and, and ask questions but at the same time under a screen of opacity um, where you, there wasn't something about having to be self-explanatory in any way mm -hmm. and this for me it, but one thing that seemed really present as a way to provide a context in, in terms of social thinking or desire or uh, any kind of metaphor for that type of space, architecture seemed this perfect metaphor because, and when I think about it now, I was attracted to these buildings that I, were completely what, that, what informed me. Like I was mm -hmm. born in 1970 in Addis Ababa. This is when you had the Haile Selassie project kind of coming to an end of, mm -hmm. in terms of the modernist, the pan-African modernist um, alternative dream, like dream mm -hmm. in a way. And thinking about the non-aligned Third mo movement in terms of a Cold War moment. This was this was it was under that intentionality, mm -hmm. and then that that then the collapse of all of that effort that that informed me and has in a sense kind of <coughs> always been generative or been part of the engine that drives the way that I think about what might be possible. Um, and I feel like so much of that desire is embedded inside mm -hmm. of buildings, and then especially from that time there was this real effort at trying to invent something else with space. And so that's just been a formative way, language of visual and aesthetic language that I've kind of under, grown up and been raised in. And I mean, because it's interesting to me, I mean, do you, to be an architect, you actually have to build things? I think so, yes. <laughs> what scale, maybe it's, you have to um, you have to create space. You have to create um, mechanisms uh, to create relationships between people and space. Mm -hmm. So I do think that's fundamental. I don't know if you necessarily have to build buildings or certain types of buildings, but I think you do have to construct relationships through space and form. 
And Julie, to be a painter, do you have to paint? Yeah, I, I mean, think so. No, I mean, because your work is so involved, for example, with drawing, um, yeah. and comes out of drawing in many ways. Yeah, but I really think that drawing, I think of drawing and painting are really different. And I think the history of painting and engaging within that history and what happens in painting, and painting can be, it can happen on and in space. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's a, le a history and a, and, a, and a language that painting, that you're working within and challenging in a sense. And part of that is with drawing or printmaking. But I, do, I don't think that, um, well, I don't know. I, mean, yeah, I don't think that you can paint just in your mind. Although that could be, you know. I mean, I would argue, I just to be a little provocative, okay, that, yeah. that, that, that one of the things that makes your work so revolutionary is sort of this marriage between drawing and painting. You blow up painting by making a drawing, and you blow up drawing by making a painting, which is you know, kind of tautological, but I think that's... They still, engage, they still exist in the two-dimensional space and imagination of painting, in that mm -hmm. history of whether it's paint, drawing and painting. What, 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 that distinction, to me, is not, you know... It's still, there's still something within that that, and the reason I guess I want to insist on that is that I, the, I, the reason I think about drawing or the mark as, as, a, mm -hmm. as a gesture of a radical possibility or this gesture, activist gesture, is that there's an insistence on it, on, that, on this kind of I am here moment. And I think that, I think that's really essential in the yes. history of painting as well. And that I think that, so I insist on what is possible and to be a contributor to that language and to exist within the thousand. 40,000 year history of painting. Mm -hmm. So let's. 60,000 year, whatever you want to call it. Long. Mm -hmm. Could you both talk a little bit about how you collaborate with others um, in different ways? I mean, you've collaborated in different ways in different times, and love to kind of hear how maybe each maybe pick one example of one collaboration that was particularly important to, to each of you. I think as this is flashing up right now, and John is over there, but. Um, so this is the Collier Memorial at MIT. And I think and John Oxendorf was a collaborator on the project. And well um, timed. <laughs> yeah, I, I planned that out. Yeah. Um, I think that like when I work with artists, I feel like they force me to be a better architect. And I would say the same with excellent engineers. They force you to be better at your own discipline. Um, uh, because of not only their contribution to the project, because they ask the most um, sharp questions that you you have already forgotten. You mm. know, the, the most basic and essential questions that are the why questions that I think among your own discipline you stop asking at some point because there's a kind of accepted understanding of what the uh, discipline is interested in at that moment, and it's these external voices and collaborators that I think every time I work truly collaboratively with someone from a different discipline, the work is really original, and it's not because of me, it's because of the collaboration. That's great. Um, I think I, I collaborate with people in a d different, yeah. different way, but... Uh, mm -hmm. There are different, like if I work with printmakers and, and when I make etchings, I work with, uh, and I think these are very important, I think the master printer is an incredible collaborator and does exactly what you're talking about, and that they bring this other technology and this other way of looking at anything that I do and, and not taking anything for granted. And so challenging mm -hmm. every aspect of it, but also because physically they can take everything apart, I can take right. everything apart. And they will bring, they will bring their own um, knowledge to and 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 capability to invent something else within that way. So I do feel like that provides this other way, of, and there was that always pushes the painting forward. Then I've also had opportunities to collaborate um, with several times with musicians or to do the set for an opera and with Peter Sellers and. Um, but but I did a collaboration recently with Jason Moran, and it was. It was. It wasn't necessarily a collaboration in that we both we both made an independent work, but we worked alongside each other, and I was really it was exceptional. I was working in this church, and I was working on these enormous paintings for San Francisco, and we were both working right after the election of uh, Donald Trump, and so we ha we had begun the project 
it, during the campaigns. And then, and this was a really, it was a very fraught m year, and it has been since, but it was an intense moment to be working on these enormous pieces. And somehow or another, it, the, the experience was like providing a, a separate sense, like if we have the sense of vision and ta taste and intuition as another sense, it was as if there was a sense that I could watch or listen to myself work in a way. And so, but it was alongside one another. So it was in, so when I was really lost and he was lost and we were both, like I said, he was making his own score and I was working. There were moments that we informed each other that couldn't have been otherwise, but we were, but it was really, there. when I was really engaged, it was as if whatever I was doing, I was hearing and this was this other sense. And I don't know how to explain that other than. Uh, like architecture cannot happen without many other disciplines, um, from the engineers to the planners to the client, you know. And so a work can't, most works cannot be, of architecture cannot be produced without a client. And that changes, I think, the dynamic and the state in which one does work. No, I mean, I agree, I think. But there are moments when you're doing something in, 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 in a process and working where, it's, where that doesn't exist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's generative of something else. You both, in different ways, alluded to the kind of limits of words or the idea when you were saying about quoting other people or writing the proposal. I mean, one of the things that I think sometimes is, is lost today is the idea of making as a form of learning and knowing the actual process of making and what one learns from that and the things that are kind of ineffable that are hard to describe and you know was the old adage that you know if I could if I could talk what it was say what it was about and there would no need to make it I'd love to know for each of you in your process what what is your what do you feel that you're learning what do you how do you, how does the process inform the content and how you work Um, you know, it, it's interesting, the question, because the artists that I love uh, work in the medium of, I would say, generative drawing. But um, I think for me, uh, to study something, to go through that searching process, as a student, it was the model and not the drawing that helped me kind of think through things. Um, and because it allowed for accidents, like turning it upside down, et cetera, it led to discoveries that were more inquiry-like uh, for me than the drawing was able to do as a medium. And I think because architecture is so material-based, um, we like to imagine that we can uh, make with material, but of course, we're drawing, our, our drawings are instruments of service for others to make the building, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a really different relationship between both the kind of model and the drawing once you're in the practice of architecture. Um, from, I, I think that every time I, I go to the studio, which is almost every day, I'm, I am in there trying to realize something else. And, mm -hmm. and I guess what I mean by that is that I'm pushing the language and want the language and whatever I end up doing within the marks or with, within the drawing or within the painting, I want to be surprised by it. I want to be completely like, I want the floor to drop out from under me. It's this feeling where it's almost like chasing the dragon of that first moment that you made, um, we made expression. something that really changed or shifted who, who I was. And that's what, I, that's what I keep pushing for in the studio and in the evolution of the work. And, so first it was this early, these early marks of trying to like, how do I make, how can I make a mark that has meaning or that, mm -hmm. that has meaning for me? And then how can I play around with making these visual, visual neologisms that use Augustan hand mark or like a part of Augustan brush with a Hammond's handprint that re reverts back to 20,000 years before that then moves forward to another, my, my own mm -hmm. sc sc scribble that moves into something else. And that this, these neologisms and the, these intentions can force and break find a new break in abstraction and invent something else within that space for a different type of culture that hasn't been a part of that language and that history. And the reasons those utterances even occur in language. And so um, for me, every day is about trying to invent and mine at the same time. And what, where, I, where I, 
end up as like a different, hopefully a different location somehow. Okay, so talking about the stadium, I mean, we're in Rome, you both spent time here. Um, in what way says Rome, Italian, um, architecture, art, history, um, connected to your work? Why has it you know, been important for each of you? Well, maybe building on the mark as an actor. I think in Rome you see very evidently architecture as a kind of actor in urban space and urban form and urban place uh, in a way that maybe in a, growing up in the U.S. You, you would never get to experience. And um, in that way, I think architecture could be read as a mark too, a kind of accumulation of these marks over time that are inhabited and spatialized, and the layers of those marks um, create this incredible, incredible city. I mean, the city does feel like a giant topographical drawing, I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, with all the layers and the pentamenti and everything, but um, to me. It's... And the agency of that history, mm -hmm. its projection elsewhere, yeah. and the complexities of that. And has, or has um, the art and architecture of Rome been particularly important to you at various times? I mean, yeah. yeah, I don't think I'd be making the work I'm making if I hadn't been coming to really? Rome for the last, I don't think so in the same way. I mean, Why? I think, I think so if I look at some of my early drawings and I started to make them after a couple of years after I'd been coming to Rome, they look like excavations themselves. They feel, they have this mm -hmm. sense of some kind of, of that, of that, of an embedded past inside mm -hmm. of them, and that, that feels so much to me what the city is. But also I think that um, the painting in the city has been really informative to me, mm -hmm. and I mean mm -hmm. that in terms of, is there some buzzing going on? Are you guys okay? Could see anyway, um, yeah, the history of painting and, and the Renaissance and the theater and kind of the, the this kind of visualization of that that's, that's mm -hmm. been really formative for me. Just visually. I guess what I would like to start with is by saying I don't think abstraction in any way, forms, or means is apolitical ever. And I think that um, there's no way to think of any type of visual language without thinking about the social or the political, that it's there and completely embedded and engaged with one another. They're reflective of each other, it's a complete semiotic relation, completely embedded. So I think for me, and this effort of constantly trying to negotiate and realize where I am and also trying to understand everything that's taking place around me and, and also in making, I had been using photographs a lot of times for, the, for architectural work. And in, when I left, when I started to not use the architectural, um, the tracings of the buildings, I was much more engaged in what was happening in the photographs that I had been using for mm -hmm. all these years. And so I started to create these paintings that worked, the point of departure was a blurred image from a particular mm -hmm. whatever, whatever, was, whatever mm -hmm. it was that I was engaged in. In this case, it was the, the um, separatist um, protests that were in um, Barcelona a couple of years ago. Um, and this woman, I was interested in, I was collecting these photographs of, of individuals that were being that were, they were being somehow by representatives of the state were being mm -hmm. um, physically handled in whatever way. And you know, before this, I had been working with images. I had made a painting, that's, I think it's towards the end of the images, of um, the, the extrajudicial killings in, or the kind of riots or, and protests that took place after extrajudicial killings by police officers of mm -hmm. brown people in the United States, black people in the United States, and mm -hmm. men and women. And to me, these, those events, whether it was an image in Ferguson and the riots in Ferguson that led into a painting. It was usually an image that really haunted me in terms of the structure of it, but also that had some, as a, as a news image and as a media image, had a relationship to art history or and, and history painting. This, for example, to me brings up anything from Jericho to you know, Liberty Leading the People. There's this really this weird structure. Yeah, this is an image in Ferg this is an image in Charlottesville of, of this confrontation of Antifa and um, Rally to the Right. Protests. And so for me, the, I, I, Charlottesville played this role, this, this event, this, this rally to the right event that took place that got so much media attention. It was, it was, it was, enormously, um, it was enormously complicated and, mm -hmm. and, and, and violent and difficult in that 
it, what it symbolized and, and was a metaphor for more than the number of people who were actually there and, right. and acted in this way, in the fascistic kind mm -hmm. of way. So it was this reaction to the memorial, not the memorials, but mm -hmm. the, the monuments, monuments, thank you, the, um, the, the, that, were, that, were, that, that were being removed. Mm -hmm. And to me, what, was, what became, I started to blur the photograph. What became really important to me was what was happening in the subconscious and what it was mm -hmm. bringing up, what, it, what the whole event brought up in the subconscious of, of Americans, and especially, I think, um, Americans of color and African Americans and anyone who's had to really negotiate that type of violence. And I actually don't think anyone avoids violence when it exists, but that, that, that how there's this hauntingness that happens socially mm -hmm. in that, and it, and it really came up in the language and the nativist kind of aggressive fascistic language that the last elect that came up in the, the uh, during the campaign for the last mm -hmm. election, and this action, this kind of social action that reinforced that language and that was actually in some ways approved by the by the by the president. This became this very. I was very interested in what it was regurgitating mm -hmm. socially mm -hmm. in the image and. But I, but I was interested in the ghost of that, and what mm -hmm. were the ghosts that were brought up in that, and what was, what was, what, what, what was terrifying in the subconscious, mm -hmm. not just in that action, mm -hmm. how that was put in shape. Mm -hmm. And while there was a fatality mm -hmm. there from as a result of that direct action, mm -hmm. Heather hair, yeah, hair, yeah, hair. and this is an Im that that was an image of that. Mm -hmm of that moment, again, mm -hmm. reminding mm -hmm. me of, you can think of Seven Acts of Mercy, you can think of the Caravaggio right at the French church of mm -hmm. um, Saint, the martyrdom of St. Matthew mm -hmm. that looks similar mm -hmm. to this man who's right. a, so these, the image is, is captures me not just because mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the historic image, but mm -hmm. the hist its place in the history mm -hmm. of image making in terms of painting. And my blurring of that into this invention for something else. Um, and what I the, the what I what I'm interested in in the blurring is that the ghost this other ghost mm -hmm. becomes also generative to something and that there is despite the annihilation and desire mm -hmm. to annihilate there's this insistence on being on this other form of yeah. cre creation and imagination and that's this space that I'm like investigating. I mean, because it's so. I mean, you know, you're part of a. I mean, widely speaking, generation of. of um, artists of color who have really combined the notion of abstraction and social political content. I mean, you know, Glenn, for example, Ligon, or um, Mark Bradford. Um, uh, at what point does the um, aesthetics of abstraction overwhelm the message, not that there is a message, but the kind of social content? At what, I mean, because in a way, you're creating a tension between the two. And, you know, it's the it's the term that um, Mark has often used of social abstraction, the idea of social and abstraction, and that both can be present, and that you don't have to relinquish one for the other, and both can be militant in their own way. Um, well, how, I how would you... almost argue that mm -hmm. that has always been the case with abstraction, mm -hmm. and I don't see, I don't, I other mm -hmm. than the other than the desire of an individual to to claim that they're working in a complete non-space, but that's an impossibility mm -hmm. in our, in, in any. So like Russian constructivism, where it's totally, mm -hmm. quote unquote, abstract, is all about. It's the about invention of an effort of a particular desire and idea, and mm -hmm. that is without a doubt social. And what, and I think the same thing of whether it's the early abstract expressionists, or the or in, in a minimalist gesture, Robert Ryman, wh whoever you want to think about, okay. I don't think that that can exist without there being, a, there, without there even being a mirror of some type of social reflection. So in that sense, my interest is not about, I mean, I show these source images because these are where I'm, this right. is what is a point of departure for me in accessing the capability of, of trying to invent mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested in the gaps of the history of abstraction, but also the place of possibility of what can happen when one encounters a work of art. So that work of art is fundamentally transformative. If that can mm -hmm. happen, that's not because of it's not because of what it necessarily represents conveys it's what it's how it, it viscerally moves and shifts an individual. Which well, it's interesting because Brian Stevenson, who is very involved directly on the political side of things, has said, and it's actually it sounds like almost the same thing that you were saying. The space of our lack is also the space of our possibilities, yeah. and it's where somehow aesthetics and politics 
intersect because I've always maintained that you know art is about putting out new paradigms and alternative ways of thinking, and it's a way of pushing things forward in a different way. Maybe we should. Um, I was trying to no, jump I in. Yeah, to but I was going to say maybe you could, maybe you could, maybe you could, maybe Jin, you could talk a little bit, maybe and, you know, very specifically about what it is that you're doing, but then maybe talk a little bit more metaphorically about the larger sense. Yeah. So um, I'm working on the. Um, Memorial for Enslaved Laborers at UVA, and um, I wanted to start with this Fred Wilson project, which you know I came across for the first time as an undergraduate student, um, reading a little essay called Mining the Museum, and it was my first um, uh, realization that institutional critique was a art form. <laughs> I was very young. And, uh, and this Fred work, will be a resident here in January to put in a little plug for yes, the academy. Yes. <laughs> and um, this work, I think, was um, like it just hit me in the gut, you know, and I saw it as like a black and white image in an essay this big. Um, so he was working with the collection and as his critique, he um, took slave shackles of the same period and placed it with these kind of ornate decorative metal works. And I think for, for me, that's like, I feel like I could never do anything as powerful as this work by Fred. And so very um, uneasy taking mm -hmm. on the commission of um, the uh, Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at UVA. And so the story begins for me like um, four years ago, but I guess the story really begins 400 years ago. And this um, map, uh, of course, it refers to um, the kind of immigration from Africa when we know it was a kind of brutal kidnapping and enslavement. and and torture, and it's part of the founding of uh, this the America. Um, and so UVA itself has this uh, really important place in US history, but also in the kind of institutional, educational American narrative. Uh, and if you look at this map, this is um, the first representation of an African American enslaved person in 1827, if you zoom in, and it's a caregiver uh, taking care of a small child. And so when we were asked to um, uh, do this work, I felt uh, fearful, not fearless. Mm -hmm. And I thought the only way I could do it was with amazing collaborators. So we've been working with Mabel Wilson, um, Frank Dukes, who uh, specializes in environmental conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. um, Eto Otutigbe is the artist. And what Mabel encouraged us to do was, um, I was just focused on the brutality and the violence and how could architecture in any way represent and do memorialize this, this uh, history. And she encouraged us to look at the resilience, um, the uh, joy, the fortitude. And, um, uh, and so the memorial is actually based on this concept of the ring shout, which is a kind of gathering of um, the enslaved at the time in song and uh, kind of cathartic dance. And so the idea for the memorial was instead of focusing on a monument or an object, was actually to create a space for gathering and also for black voices to make a space that was contemporary as opposed to a kind of object. Um, and that it would be part of this Freedom Day where um, uh, people march from the auction block um, the slave auction block uh, to, to the grounds and then be a kind of launching point. And so the um, memorial is really just um, a circular space of gathering that's 80 feet in diameter, the same as the rotunda, Jefferson's rotunda. But instead of being this kind of closed sphere, it's actually two intersecting cones uh, that create a space of um, many layers. Um, layers that would not only be a space of gathering, but a space of marks. 
marks that recognize every individual enslaved person. Um, for me, what was shocking was to learn that, um, you know, it was only 400 only, it's like the wrong word, but 430,000 in um, Africans were brought, African people were brought to the U.S. Uh, and at um, the end of Civil War, it was four million people. Um, so uh, when UVA in 2007 acknowledged its history, they made a little memorial marker where they wrote a few hundred enslaved and freed um, people helped Jefferson realize his vision. And that was the catalyst mm -hmm. for a kind of student um, challenging the administration for the inadequacy of that memorial and the recognition of the history of slavery on campus. So it's really the students who were fearless and challenging the institution. And um, the biggest challenge was how to recognize the approximate 4,000 individuals for whom we do not know their mm. names. We only know about 17% of the names, 13 to 17% of the names. But there's accu really accurate, precise recording because the enslaved were property. Right. So they are a <coughs> careful accounting of what every individual did. Um, so the memorial has uh, 4,000 memory marks, we call them, of these kind of lines carved into the stone. And where we know a name or a familial relation, we inscribe that above the memory mark and uh, understand that this is a kind of history that's being archived and researched. And so as new names are discovered, and in the, two, in the last two years, two new names were actually discovered by the, the scholars. And so um, this is just a kind of um, mock-up of, of some of the names. And the um, exterior of the memorial is where we had the opportunity to work with uh, Eto Otutigbe. Um, and we brought Eto in like midway through the process because as we were working with the community, I realized as an architect I could not address what the community wanted, which was a representation of enslaved people. And in the community sessions, people would ask for a statue or right. a kind of this represent. is what happened with the Vietnam um, Memorial, yeah, exactly. Like that when Myelin did it, and then yeah. afterwards they did a figurative exactly. version. Of and I couldn't work figuratively. I, right. It's like I, I just couldn't. So I asked Eto to come join our team. And um, for me, it would be wrong. Like I couldn't invent uh, mm -hmm. a representation mm -hmm. of enslavement. But he worked archivally, and this is an image of Isabella Gibbons, who was an enslaved woman who was freed um, and stayed in Charlottesville and became a teacher. Um, and then this is a gravestone of an enslaved person that's unmarked, but the kind of roughness of the uh, stone itself. So we knew that the representation had to not be the kind of smooth, polished, inner liner of the memorial. Uh, and this is Eto's work, which when I saw, I, I, I knew we had to work with Eto, who was looking at these kind of scarifications um, of, uh, of African art, and then creating this, these portraits of himself using this technique called um, V-grooving, which based on your perspective, um, you see, but also disappears when you um, are, are no longer in the right perspective. And so Isabella Gibbons' eyes are um, kind of carved into the memorial where you can just see it at a kind mm -hmm. of certain vantage point. And um, this is the memorial under construction now, but the kind of contrast between the inside and the outside. Um, and the idea that it's a kind of landform like UVA, Jefferson's UVA was really a kind of landscape meets architecture um, project. So, 
And while this was happening, um, of course, um, the memorial, you know, we started, the, the students started the process in 2011. The president of the university created the Commission mm -hmm. on Slavery. And then um, in Charlottesville, there was an ongoing debate about what to do with the Robert E. Lee statue. Yeah. So the community was meeting for years before the Unite the Right rally. Yeah. And uh, unable to conclusively decide what to do with the mm. monument, the Robert right. E. Lee monument. So it's no, um, no yeah, surprise that as this debate was happening, as the memorial was being designed and a lot of community engagement and conversations were happening, the Unite the Right rally um, entered onto campus. And I think it actually... Was it a direct result of those? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. And um, it had only negative consequences except for the one consequence of the community, the campus community, really, really coming together. Well, I don't... Well, the writer Maya Angelou said, without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. And I just want to thank both of you. And I also want to thank the American Academy in Rome for being a place where artists and scholars and the one, you know, these are the places, the nodes of, of freedom and courage and creativity and possibility that we talked about tonight. So um, thank you both for the work that you're doing in the world. And it's a privilege and honor to be here with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.